Welcome to another Now Playing vlog where I talk about the board games that I've been playing lately and what I think of them. I've put links to all the games in the description below. This video wouldn't exist without the support of my Patreon backers. If you'd like to help Actual Lol grow bigger and better, go to patreon.com forward slash actual lol. Let's get on with it. Decrypto is a party game that you play on teams. You're trying to get codes across to your team and also crack the codes of the other team. So you're assigned four words for the whole game on your team side, very simple words, and they are one, two, three, four. And then when it's your turn to give clues, you get a little code card that will say a number, two, three, four, or four, two, three, and you then have to give three clues in the right order that are matching those words. And so you want to make it clear enough for your team that they guess the code right, but you want to be cagey so that the other team don't crack your code because at the end of each round, they're going to be told what your code number was. So they're going to know that this word related to two and this word related to three, and they start to create patterns on their sheet. They're writing all that information down. And so if they start to get close to what your word might be, then they can really easily crack your code on a future round. The way you win the game is by either cracking the other team's code twice or by failing twice. So your team not guessing the code. And I really like that balance. You've got to be cagey enough so that the other team don't get it, but you also, if you're too cagey or too weird with your clues, then your team won't get it and they'll be frustrated with you. It's a little bit like code names or crosstalk, games like that, but it also completely stands on its own. One of the great things about it, I think, is that you get a taste of everything. In code names, you play the clue giver for the whole game and you play a guesser for the whole game. In Decrypto, you play one game, you get a chance to uh, give clues, like because you take it in turns, you get a chance to guess clues, but then you've also got this other aspect to it where you're trying to crack the other team's code. So there's effectively three games in there, and all of them are really good fun. The, being able to crack another team's code, getting close to working out what their words are is really nice. The challenge of coming up with your clues, it's... It's definitely really challenging, but it doesn't have the AP that people can get with code names where they spend ages and find it so hard to link things together. This doesn't have that at all. It's really easy to come up with clues um, in, in Decrypto, but obviously you need, might need to spend a bit of time to come up with a slightly more interesting or different one that's going to fox the other team. And then guessing, guessing is probably the simplest and easiest part of it, but there's as the game gets later on and your teammates are having to be more obtuse with their clues, it certainly gets tricky. And because really the tactics of the game late on is that you can feel the other team are close to you. So they might know some of your words or they feel close. What you need to then do is give clues for other words that feel similar somehow. So if you've got the words tree and wood, how can you kind of cross those over and still get your teammate to guess it, but, but the, other, the other team are gonna be confused by that. That's what you need to do. And so, yeah, it, it feels great to kind of work together and have a hunch on what the other team's clue um, code might be based on previous answers. And then the challenge of giving your own clues. It's got an incredible production. The cards are slotted into these little decoder screens. So the cards are all jumbled up so you can't read them. They're double sided. There's loads of words in this game. And then when you slot them into these little red screens, you can read the words. It has this wonderful 80s Cold War vibe, but also the box looks really modern. It's a really beautifully produced party game, which isn't something I say very often. And the game has these wonderful tense moments where you reveal your guesses either for your team or you're guessing the other team. And it's like, oh, they, were, they got us last round. Are they going to get us again this round? And sometimes you'll win at exact, on exactly the same round. You'll both guess each other. I think the crypto is a flawless game. I'm not saying it's better than code names, but I do think it's a more complete experience. The way that you get to give clues, guess clues, and also crack the other teams. It's just, you get a full experience of the entire thing that the game has to offer in one playthrough. It also just looks better. It's this perfect little box of what I think party games should be in 2018. And it just represents how good party games will become. So if you haven't guessed it already, Decrypto absolutely gets actual love. It's probably going to be the best party game of 2018. I can say that even at this early stage. We'll see. I'd love to see games 
other games being produced of this quality, absolutely check this one out. That's Decrypto. Skyward is a card game that has an I split you choose mechanism. And what that means is that one person in a round will divide up a selection of cards into equal piles to the number of players in the game. And then everyone else will take it in turns to pick one of those piles with the person who split the selection picking last. So if you've played the game New York Slice, which was based on Piece of Cake, that is probably the most famous. And there's a few others out there. I do think it's actually a type of gameplay that isn't used that often. And I found it really fun in New York Slice. So it's certainly interesting to try uh, Skyward to see what it offered. So the idea of the game is that you're building these cities that are floating in the sky and you're trying to build the best one. And what you're getting from these cards are different structures and buildings that you're gonna put into your city, but also the resources that you need to build them. So there are maybe three or four colors or types of resources in the game and cards will have requirements to, to be able to effectively build them and you'll need those types of resources. And so instantly it becomes quite interesting because if you split up the cards, you can put the buildings that need certain resources and those resources into separate piles just to kind of mess everyone around. There's also wild resources and the person who picks the opportunity to split next time gets a free wild resource because generally it's not so good to split up because you get the last pick. So they give you that as a, a little reward. And that wild resource is really useful because it can be really tricky to find the right resources that you need in this game. And so you'll end up with loads of loads of cards of things that you want to build and you're just not able to build them because the resources, you're not able to get those resources as well. And it plays quite simply. Uh, it's very straightforward. It It's clear that what you need to build these buildings and then the buildings tend to have powers on them. So there's a little bit of engine building to it where you might build a building that then makes it cheaper to build other yellow buildings later on. And so it it does have some interesting decisions in that respect. Although I did found, find that the game is surprisingly short. And so there wasn't necessarily, if I built that building to get cheaper yellow buildings, I might only use it once or twice. In a two player game, I found that the splitting things up was fun and interesting and and certainly had some decision making because you can kind of track what the other person wants and what you want and you're trying to offer them the best pile so they'll definitely take that one but still leave you the things that you want. In a three and a four player game, the amount of cards that you split each round just became a lot. And a lot of these cards have text on that you have to read. So if you're playing the game for the first time or with other newbies, you gotta read them all when you're splitting up because otherwise you don't understand what you're splitting up and therefore you might give someone a pile that's way too powerful. And it just got too long and it wasn't, it didn't feel valuable enough time. Everyone else is just sitting around whilst you're just going through all of the cards trying to work out what they are. So I think as a two player game, kind of for a bit of a filler experience, maybe a filler plus, I think it works quite well. But then the box, it's just a bit too annoyingly big. It's just a deck of cards, really. Oh, and some and some tokens. And I just feel like it, it wasn't valuable for that. I think I would have kept this game if it was maybe a quarter of the size, um, the, but it it's just too big for what it is. And then I would have probably only played it at two players, not at three. Four was just, was just ridiculous. It, everyone else is just sitting around whilst you decide what to split. So I think it's not a bad game. There's some very clever, simple ideas, certainly really easy to get into, but that I split, you choose thing, I was looking for another game like that to add to my collection, but it didn't do enough that was so cool that it warranted that amount of time spent. And I would really just much rather play New York Slice, which I just absolutely love as an I split, you choose game. Had some nice artwork. I think there's things to be applauded here, but it just didn't quite hit the spot. That's Skyward. Hunter Las Cartas is a card negotiation game. This is based on a very old game called Hunter, which is about being corrupt dictators in a fictional South American country. And there was also Hunter Viva El Presidente, which is a game that I have and really like. And now this is like, that was like the dice game version of the original game. The original game I think was like, three hours long or possibly longer. Then you've got the dice game, which is about an hour. And then you've got the card game, which I would say is also about an hour, but a smaller box just coming in cards. And 
the basic idea of this game is that one person is the president and they are divvying up cards money um, for the other players. So they might be giving lots to one person or trying to spread out evenly. Do they want to stay in power or do they want to and do they want to keep everyone happy or do they only want to keep some people happy? And so people are trying to get the most money from the president with negotiation and but then they also have the power to vote on whether they're going to be the president again. So you've got these cards that you play down in front of you that will vote on certain things and there's a nice light humor to this game. You've got like the Christians and the hippies and the right-wing um, people and the suburbs and all the different types of people that are going to vote on um, whether the president stays in. They've got, all got different political power. And so each round you can decide whether you stay with the president or go against them. And there's uh, you, you're kind of working out, you're taking it in turns to pledge your allegiance. And so the president is maybe trying to persuade people different ways. They can maybe offer up more money that they didn't already assign to people. It's all assigned face down. So the other players don't know how much you've been given. And of course you could be nice to people and the other players don't know that you're like really playing favorites and then they might support you in a future round. Um, and then there's a few power cards, action cards that can be played where maybe the police can um, kind of cordon off or take, take away the power from one certain section of society. There's also these buildings that you can put down, they stay down permanently and you can assign them each round that you use them. But ultimately you're voting on whether the president stays in or not and so that will determine who gets the money. If the president is voted out then there's a military coup and then you decide whether you are siding with the, the coup or you're again siding with the president and that's where you play cards where you you decide which side to stay in and then you play cards face down with a power. They all have like bomb symbols on and depending on how much military power you have, that will decide who wins. And if you're on the winning side of the coup, you're going to get money and if you're not, you're going to lose stuff. I really like that there are two in front of you. It's very simple, but you have money that is safe. That's on your offshore bank account and then you have like your little safe on top of that to show that. And then above the safe, you have money that is in the hands of your middleman. So he's looking after it before he can quite get it to your offshore bank account. So it's still at risk. And there are certain cards that mean you can steal from other, sh other people's uh, middleman and things like that. It's very similar to a game called Tifa Tashin, which I really liked from last year's Essen. That game is quite streamlined and simple it's again somebody divvying up money and then you're kind of voting on, secretly you're voting on who to stay in power and there's a few other things going on. And this one is still um, simple in rules but it has a little bit more complication in terms of action cards and things like that. And so I can see somebody liking one over the other and I kind of like both. Uh, Tifa Tashin is a great streamlined experience. Hunter has a little bit more chaos in it. Um, so maybe a little bit more luck heavy, but also maybe some slightly bigger moments. Um, I would say that it's a little bit more complicated to try and explain, trying to tell people how the voting works and then how the coup works can be a tiny bit fiddly, but I think once you've played it once, it isn't really that hard. <laughs> maybe I've just struggled with it. And so I really enjoy this type of game and therefore I really like this game. I think it does it brilliantly and I've tried to play Junta Viva El Presidente since to try and work out which one I like more and to be honest I like them both. In Junta Viva El Presidente you're kind of attacking other players. You don't have to attack the president and so you can, other people can be attacking the president, you can attack them and you're doing it secretly by assigning dice. In this one you're kind of building up more teams. It's really who's on the president's side and who isn't. But just like with all of these games, it's all about staying hidden, trying to make money without other people noticing. And very seldom is it the player that's the president for the longest that wins the game because they've had to appease people for far too long and give out much more money that, than they're making themselves. So it's never about being the president for too long. It's about just trying to be on, this, on the right side and persuade people around to your way of thinking. Hunter Las Cartas gets a seal of actual love because I love this kind of game. It's full of discussion. You get a full negotiation experience of backstabbing and persuading people 
in a relatively short time. It certainly takes longer the more you get into it. So maybe about an hour. And it's a really nice small box with a light funny theme. So yeah, I, I've just had a blast with it every time I played it and I'm certainly looking forward to playing it again and I would recommend it to anyone that maybe wants to try a negotiation game but doesn't want the full three hours that you might get with New Angeles or Spartacus or something. This is a good entry to that and a good short alternative. That's Hunter Las Cartas. Elos is a game where you are sending your boats to explore an archipelago and then you are mining certain goods, collecting those goods and then trying to raise their value on a kind of stock market. It certainly doesn't look like a stock market game, but it does kind of play like one because it has this wonderful production. You've got these nice wooden boats and people and the islands look really beautiful. Effectively what you're doing is playing cards, action cards. So everything you do needs a certain card. So to put a boat down on the spot, you spend a card to um, start mining in a certain place to get resources. To raise a value on the stock market, you need to use a certain card. Each of those cards has a cost and that is in discarding other cards. So you will have to decide what other cards in your hand you are willing to discard to be able to use those actions. And some actions are a lot more costly than other ones. And so being able to collect more cards, which is, and you get cards equal to how many boats you have down on the board is certainly a really useful thing. But you also want to start racing to produce goods because when you start mining a good, you will get one of those goods every round until the end of the game. And so you want to get early into producing the goods, but you also want to get in early to raising the value of goods because if other people, there's maybe sort of 10 cards in the game that allow you to raise the value of goods. If they start raising the goods that they are producing and not the ones that you're producing, then you're screwed and yours is all your goods are worth one point at the end of the game and all of theirs are worth five points. It's certainly good to watch what other people are producing and also copy them because then you're both going to raise the value up together. It's in both your interests. And so it's a really interesting dilemma to know whether to go first with trying to get loads of things or try to do a bit of both, but then you'll find that someone else has produced loads of gold and that value has really increased. And I found it quite hard to know what to do first in the game. And it felt like you were just racing to do stuff and then maybe some people would get left behind. Um, one thing that I didn't especially like was that gold can increase far greater in value than anything else. So the other three basic resources, I don't know, maybe they can go up to five and gold can go up to 10. There are only a limited number of times that you can play those stock market cards in the game. So once a certain number of resources has been raised, that's it. And so you might get gold up to 10 and then everyone's just racing to get gold because the other resources are worth nowhere near as much. And so you're trying to explore new hexes and send your boats off to them. And so it does have a real race element to it. And I, it, there is this fine balance of how do you use your cards and do you have enough cards? There's also another aspect of the game where you can put pirates down on certain hexes, which means that all of the islands nearby, if they're gonna do certain actions, they have to spend extra cards because there are pirates in the region that are making it harder for them to do things. I felt that that didn't have a big enough impact and also for you to spend one of your boats on it and spend time and actions to do that on your turn, it felt like a waste and didn't really advance your game enough. It's a beautiful production. It has these really thick cardboard tokens, wooden boats, the artwork's lovely. It doesn't look like a stock market game, which I think is a, possibly a little bit cheating. I think some people will be drawn to this wonderful box and what the game, it sort of feels like it's selling you on this exploration theme and yet it doesn't really play like that. I think there's a lot to respect about this game. I think that the action card system is very simple. The rules are really, um, it's just a couple of pages and yet it just didn't pull me back in. There's interesting decisions in this game for sure. And it's, it's not quite a gateway experience I would say because it isn't immediately obvious what you should do. And I think players can really get behind in it and people could be scoring way more than other players at the end of the game. I just found that it was quite forgettable. I played it a few times. I never really felt like I had to play it again. And so whilst there's nothing especially wrong with the package, I just wouldn't recommend it over so many other games that I love in my collection. That's Elos. 
The last two games I want to talk about are quite similar. They're Dr. Microbe and Panic Mansion. These are both from Blue Orange Games, and they're very similar to some previous games that they've done called Dr. Eureka and Go Go Gelato. Um, the reason being is that they're speed games, really. You flip over a card and it tells you what to do, and then you've got to do it faster than anyone else. And Dr. Eureka was the first example where you're pouring balls from test tubes into things, and then Go Go Gelato, uh, is one that I really like where you've got um, ice cream cups and um, scoops and you're trying to and so there's a dexterity element and a speed element and so I thought that I would be I would like these games as well. Um, Dr. Microbe has a petri dish and you've got tweezers and you're taking these little microbes from the middle and putting them in the right section of your petri dish and you're fighting with the other players to get the right ones. You can also one aspect of the game is to just take a microbe and put it into the next person's one and just kind of screw over other people. And there isn't really a puzzly challenge to this in the way that there are with the others. You kind of got to work out the order in which to do things. You're literally just trying to grab it and put it into your thing as quickly as possible. So it's much more of a dexterity game than a puzzle game. And it just feels a bit silly. Like I imagine that kids would love it, but you're just kind of fighting over over the same things and kind of budging people's hands out the way. And it's just the fastest person to do that. And so we just found that it didn't really hold our attention. Panic Mansion is a box. There's four little boxes that are divided into eight squares um, with these cardboard things. And then you've got a bunch of little trinkets in there like meeples and cubes and balls that are like um, eye eyeballs and a snake and things like that. And you're basically tipping it up and down, kind of like a puzzle that you would have had as a kid, um, to try and get them through the doorways and into the right room. So you flip the card, the card tells you where you need to get the things, uh, into which room, and then you've got to do that. And there are slightly different ways you can play the game, different levels. Um, one of the levels is where you have to get the guy, and he's like the adventurer, and then the chests, or the gold cubes, into the same room. But then you have to have everything else in other rooms. And that's quite tricky because generally things will just move together and you can't separate them that easily. Uh, and so that's where the challenge lies. And again, it's a little bit more of a dexterity challenge. And actually we found that it just takes quite a long time. Like the, the, the fun with Dr. Eureka or Go Go Gelato is that you're really just racing and you kind of do it in about five to 10 seconds. In Panic Mansion, we could all be there for, I don't know, like 20 seconds or something. And it, it loses that race aspect a little bit and you're all just kind of getting frustrated with it. So in my experience and with the people that I played it with, I didn't really find that Dr. Microbe or Panic Mansion really worked that well for adults. I can totally imagine that they would work for kids. They're really bright and wonderful to look at, really tactile, really well made. Um, games from Blue Orange, they just weren't ones that I think can translate to an adult audience in the way that Go Go Gelato would and I would recommend. So that's Dr. Microbe and Panic Mansion. Those are some of the games that I've been playing lately. There's links to where you can buy all of them in the description below. If you like this video and you want to see more of them, please subscribe to the channel. I'm John Perkis, thanks for watching.